हेलो फ्रेंड्स सो आई बी टॉकिंग ऑन दिस वेरी अल्ट्रा बेसिक टॉपिक अक्यूट रेस्पिरेटरी फेलियर आई डू इट इन मे बी टू थ्री पार्ट सो दिस वॉज अगेन डन एज पार्ट ऑफ अ ट्रेनिंग फॉर नागालैंड आई सी यू टीम टेन बेड आई सी यू टीम सो आई बी ओनली कवरिंग फ्यू बेसिक फिजियोलॉजिकल एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ अंडरस्टैंडिंग द न्यूस ऑफ रेस्पिरेटरी फेलियर सो वेन वी टॉक अबाउट रेस्पिरेटरी फेलियर so we need to understand uh, what what is the definition of respiratory failure so this is the whole respiratory system when we say respiratory failure it is not only the lungs because there are a lot of other variables that influence your breathing which includes your brain stem which includes your diaphragmatic innervation or the nerve roots then you have a pleural component then diaphragmatic component so there may be problem with any of these aspects which can lead to or there can be airway issues so if the respiratory system is not able to meet the metabolic demands of the body that is when we call there is a respiratory failure and there are i'm sure most of the listeners would know there are two types of respiratory failure one is hypoxemic respiratory failure where by definition your pao2 is less than 60 mm of mercury then there is hypercapnic respiratory failure where pco2 is more than 50 mm mercury so these are the two broad categories when we talk about respiratory failure and when we talk about the whole function of the lungs or the respiratory system there are two basic things that are happening in the respiratory system so one is oxygen tends to come inside the lungs because when we take a breath it means it is with an intent that we want to deliver oxygen to the lungs and the second process which is a follow up of this is carbon dioxide has to go out so these are the two important processes in the respiration i'm sure it's this is as simple as it can get so when we take a breath our intent is uh, we get the oxygen inside the lungs then we sort of flush our body with oxygen and then take the carbon dioxide out so there are certain determinants of oxygenation in the lungs so what are the key there are around five determinants one is alveolar oxygen concentration is very important as to how much oxygen is going into the alveoli is what is uh, important or pertinent for adequate oxygenation the second component is diffusion so where there is diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide to be eliminated so both this happen at the alveolar and capillary membrane it happens at an alveolar level so the third process is ventilation and the fourth important variable which influences oxygenation is perfusion and most importantly ventilation and perfusion although they happen concurrently there need to be a good balance so which we call as ventilation perfusion matching so then this matching has to happen for adequate oxygenation to happen so these are the five components which influence the oxygenation of the lung so when we look at See, when we take air in, it is not oxygen we take in; it is the air we take in. So, when we take the air, so obviously air has different components. So, even at alveolar level, so the, the the largest component of the alveolar pressure is with nitrogen, and the second important component is the oxygen. Oxygen is the red one, which is the largest, and the third component is carbon dioxide, and the fourth one you see as a yellow shade is the water vapor. so these are the components of the air that we take in so there is oxygen there is carbon dioxide there is nitrogen and there is a water vapor so your alveolar pressure is determined by combination of all this so alveolar oxygen alveolar carbon dioxide and water vapor pressure and alveolar nitrogen so all these four constitute the alveolar pressure in the lung so when you so there may be a situation where alveolar pressure can be altered with varying oxygen concentration so obviously when there is increased oxygen concentration which is delivered so your oxygen component in the alveolar pressure becomes more and con concomitantly the carbon dioxide because oxygen and carbon dioxide have a balance so once you increase oxygen our understanding is your carbon dioxide component contributing to the alveolar pressure comes down and same thing happens when carbon dioxide goes up so when there is a problem in exhaling, exhaling the carbon dioxide out then the oxygen component comes down and carbon dioxide so when there is a limitation of the air flow uh, expiration so the carbon dioxide tends to increase as a as a component of the alveolar pressure and the oxygen comes down 
So, so this is something which have a bi balance. So when oxygen gets affected, so carbon it has a bearing on carbon dioxide. When carbon dioxide gets affected, it has a bearing on oxygen. And all these are interdependent is what we need to bear in mind. And, and what we need to understand is ventilation is the air which are ventilating the alveoli. And there has to be an equal amount of perfusion to the alveoli for the gas exchange to happen, for the oxygen to enter the system in circulation and carbon dioxide to be vented out of the alveoli. So for that, the number of lung units should be equal to the number of vessels that are perfused in the lung units. And for that, balance to be maintained, this is important, ventilation and perfusion ratio should be equal to one, which means the number of lung units that are ventilated same amount of perfusion has to be there. If there is a discrepancy, that is when your oxygenation gets affected. So that's when we call shunt. When we say shunt, it means some of the alveoli are not participating in the ventilation. And we say uh, VP mismatch, where alveoli may be ventilated, but perfusion is affected. So that's when we call it a ventilation perfusion. So ventilation perfusion ratio should be one. If there is Disruption of this one, it means there may be either a shunt fraction or there may be a VP mismatch due to dead space ventilation. So this is how the respiratory failure sets in. So we spoke about oxygenation and the determinants, which is alveolar oxygen, diffusion, ventilation, perfusion, and ventilation, perfusion, matching. So these are the components that influence your oxygen. What about the variables that influence elimination of carbon dioxide? Because as we know, our breathing involves only taking in oxygen and getting the carbon dioxide out. So when there are variables influencing oxygenation of the lungs, so I'm sure there are variables which are influencing the carbon dioxide to come out. So what is the variable? Getting the carbon dioxide out. So for that, you need to understand something called alveolar ventilation. So alveolar ventilation is what determines your elimination of carbon dioxide. So what is alveolar ventilation? So alveolar ventilation is uh, respiratory rate into tidal volume minus dead space. So the respiratory rate into tidal volume minus dead space. So when you talk about dead space, there is anatomical dead space and there is a physiological dead space. And physiological dead space is determined. So anatomical dead space is we do not have influence. If there is anatomical, then it can be pleural effusion, or there can be uh, other elements which we do not have control. But physiological dead space is when there is discrepancy in the ventilation perfusion matching. That is when your physiological dead space ventilation happens and mismatch tends to happen. So your, your carbon dioxide elimination is predominantly influenced by respiratory rate into tidal volume minus the dead, uh, dead space ventilation. And dead space ventilation we divide into anatomical and physiological. Physiological dead space is when there is ventilation perfusion ratio is not maintained at one, we call it as physiological dead space ventilation. So summarily, your carbon dioxide elimination is determined by respiratory rate, tidal volume, and dead space ventilation or ventilation perfusion matching. If there is a mismatch, then we call it as dead space ventilation, which will compromise your oxygen. This is the determinant of carbon dioxide elimination. So when we talk about respiratory failure, this is a common question we ask for ICU trainees. So it is very important when we say, how do you classify respiratory failure? So generally it's classified into four types. So one is low FiO2. Low FiO2 is not seen in a physiological condition. Generally it is seen in high altitude areas and not necessarily it is in a pathological sort of a situation. So low FiO2, especially in high altitudes, is a reason for respiratory failure. But the ones we see in ICU are the next three, three sort of types which I'll be mentioning. One is hypoventilation. So we'll talk about it. The third one is ventilation perfusion mismatch. In ventilation perfusion mismatch, there are two important uh, types of respiratory failure. One due to shunt and one due to dead space ventilation. And the fourth one is due to diffusion impairment. And diffusion impairment, typically the example is interstitial lung disease where there is no exchange of gas happening at the alveolar and capillary membrane. So these are the four important classification, broad classifications of respiratory failure. And most common types of respiratory failure we see in ICU is the third one, ventilation perfusion mismatch. And in that, the commonest one we see is the shunt problem. 
lifestyle show is what are the common causes that we see in ICU, which is the cause of respiratory. The second commonest possibly is dead space ventilation, where we have ventilation perfusion mismatch. And the third commonest one possibly we see in ICU is hypoventilation. So we'll talk about each one of them. The first one we won't touch because it's a very simple thing, low FiO2, which typically happens in high altitude. So when you talk about your alveolar ventilation, so obviously you have this oxygen going in and then carbon dioxide coming out. So generally the alveolar concentration of oxygen is at around 110 and carbon dioxide is 37. So the whole intent of our breathing is to get able to have oxygenated blood coming out of well, ventilation with each breath. So you have a good oxygenation that happens with a good gas exchange and uh, the blood that goes out of the alveoli has is fully saturated with 100%. So that is our intent. But if you have this situation where your oxygenation of the alveoli is impeded or affected or carbon dioxide elimination is affected, so this has a bearing on enriching your oxygenation within the capillary blood. So that is when the hypoxemia tends to set in. So if you have a less oxygen going in or if you have less carbon dioxide going down, then you have alveolar oxygen coming down and alveolar carbon dioxide going up going up and that reflects in the systemic partial pressure of oxygen coming down and systemic partial pressure of carbon dioxide going up and both of these have bearing on reducing the saturation of blood that comes out from the alveolar after the alveolar ventilation. So this is the pathognomonic process that happens at the alveolar level. So we'll look into the, the low FiO2 at high altitude we won't talk. We looked into the causes of hypoventilation. So this is a beautiful diagram. So I have to acknowledge uh, this diagram is taken from Charles Gomerson's uh, teaching material. So this is a beautiful diagram. So in exam, if for a question of respiratory failure is asked for a IQ training, simplistically you can put this diagram and say you can write all the five causes and put this diagram which pretty much summarizes all the causes for hypoventilation. Because hypoventilation can happen because of problem in the brainstem. It can happen with the problem in the spinal cord. It can happen with problems at the nerve root level. And it can happen at the airway level. It can happen due to chest wall problems. It can happen at the pleural problem. Or it can happen at a, due to motor neuropathy or neuromuscular weakness. Any neuromuscular weakness can lead to hypoventilation. Or it can happen at a neuromuscular junction level, like myasthenia gravis, where you have respiratory failure setting in, where you your ventilation is not adequate to get the carbon dioxide out or, or maintaining good oxygenation. I'm sure most of the listeners would have dealt with these cases where you have neuromuscular weakness leading to respiratory failure. Or in some cases, diaphragmatic weakness also can lead to hypoventilation leads to respiratory. So simplistically, if uh, in exam you have to write, it's, it's very easy to draw this picture and denote. And these are all the causes which can cause hypoventilation in ICU. So we'll talk about, so we spoke about hypoventilation. In VP mismatch, we have dead space ventilation and ventilation perfusion shunt fraction. So what do we understand by shunt? So even if you're writing an exam, very simplistically you can draw this diagram. It, it makes our understanding so much easy when we talk about shunt. See what is happening in this diagram? So basically this alveoli, the black one, it's not participating in ventilation. See the white one, there is oxygenation, oxygen going in. And it's very simplistically, if you remember this diagram, you understand there is a good perfusion happening. You can see the blood vessels are nice and open, but ventilation is not happening. So where alveoli is not participating in gas exchange, that is when we call it as a shunt. And what happens, why hypoxemia sets in the shunt? Because this alveoli, as you see pictorially, is not participating in the oxygen oxygenation. So what happens is at that level, your alveolar saturation comes down. But in the normal alveoli, there is a good oxygenation happening. But it's the cumulative effect of the number of alveoli which are not participating in gas exchange, which adds on to the hypoxemia. And overall, systemic hypoxemia sets in. So this is a shunt that typically happens. And what are the causes of shunt? So this is, again, as, as I said, the commonest cause of respiratory failure in ICU would be ventilation perfusion mismatch. In that, the commonest one is shunt. The second one, possibly, is the dead space ventilation. The third one would be hypoventilation. These are the three common causes we see in ICU. So low FiO2 is, uh, is not seen in ICU sort of situation. Diffusion impairment, of course, when you are dealing with interstitial languages, we, deal, we do see patients with diffusion. So what are the causes of shunt? 
in icu typically the causes of all the cause of respiratory failure is due to shunt so pictorially if you see pulmonary edema so all the heart failures and pulmonary edema leads to the shunt and where alveoli is not because alveoli is filled with water so they are not participating in gas exchange or atelectasis because the, you saw the previous diagram alveoli is collapsed so they are not participating in the gas exchange or pulmonary contusion or pulmonary hemorrhage so any damage to the lungs or pneumonia commonest one is pneumonia this gray one pneumonia where alveoli are not participating in gas exchange so pneumonia ARDS pulmonary hemorrhage pulmonary contusion aspiration all these or ventilation perfusion mismatch are in some cases where diaphragm is involved where there is huge abdominal compartment syndrome diaphragm is pushed upwards causing atelectasis so all these are typically the causes that you see in icu so these are typical icu causes anything that is affecting lung parenchyma so it may be fluid it may be blood it may be atelectasis pneumonia space ventilation and you are diaphragm getting elevated because of uh, abdominal compartment syndrome causing atelectasis. All these create section fraction leads to hypoxemia. So then apart from pulmonary, there is intracardiac shunt. So all the congenital deformities like patent foramen oven or phallus tetralogy or Eason menger syndrome, any intracardiac shunt lead to hypoxemia. So simplistically, even in exam, if, if you have to write the causation, just put this image. I think it makes the your conceptual understanding much easier. So what about dead space ventilation? As I said, ventilation perfusion mismatch is the commonest cause of respiratory failure in that you have a shunt, then you have your dead space ventilation. So this again, dead space, you have to write in exam, just put this figure. See here, alveoli are nicely ventilated, but perfusion is not happening. But so like PE, pulmonary thromboembolism. So, so these are the situations where you have a microthrombi formation as part of systemic diseases. In COVID, we used to see this dead space ventilation happening. So where your blood supply is impeded or there can be hypoxemic vasoconstriction. So where there is a shunt fraction along with dead space ventilation because of severe pulmonary vasoconstriction that happens due to hypoxemia, all this leads to physiological dead space. And this is the, one of the common cause for uh, dead space ventilation. So, and in dead space ventilation, as I said, in all this shunt or dead space ventilation, uh, you have this ventilation perfusion ratio, which is not maintained equal to one. And this graph tends to go up. And, and this is a typical graph that you see where your ventilation perfusion ratio is disrupted, especially when there is a disease process causing either shunt or the dead space ventilation. So that's in brief about the physiological and conceptual understanding of respiratory failure. We spoke about the determinants of oxygenation of the lungs. We spoke about determinants of carbon dioxide elimination. Then we spoke about the commonest causes of respiratory failure and the causes in ICU. So in part two, maybe we'll speak about other aspects. So I request all our listeners to attend to the signature meeting, Global Intensive Care Symposium. So we are inviting for all the abstracts and there are good cash prizes. So it's happening on 17th to 20th of October in Bengaluru, 2024. I request all our listeners to please attend this conference and make it a huge success. So I request all our uh, audience to present your valuable work to our journal, Journal of Acute Care. So thank you. Thank you very much.